Um, I also have uh, long memories of, of Peter Davis and the Chris Eichbaum uh, post the Labour Network. Uh, we used to sit around in, in the uh, 1980s, it must have been, with uh, Peter and Chris and Helen and uh, Ian Shirley discussing how we might find a uh, I suppose a think tank, alternative think tank uh, in New Zealand. Uh, subsequent to that with Chris and Peter Harris and others in the Gamma Foundation. So there is a, a, a long history of, uh, of attempts to, um, to provide an alternative uh, to the uh, Round Table and other think tanks that have we know and love so well. Uh, I should also pay thanks to um, Richard Long for his very helpful remarks <laughs> in today and uh, Tuesday's Don Post, um, which uh, I'm sure has uh, helped, helped our attendees tonight. But I, and I take it as a, as a sign that um, the certainties that have driven this country for the last 20 years are no longer as certain in even the minds of those who have driven those certainties now as they once were. And so I think it is uh, utterly and entirely appropriate that we welcome Peter uh, at tonight, uh, a distinguished scholar in his own right, a long-term um, uh, scholar and student of uh, social democracy and all its forms, to give us his thoughts on where things sit at the moment and where they might sit. So welcome, Peter. Thank you very much for coming. We look forward to Shall I um, live up to all those um, expectations? But uh, I've been um, a uh, subscriber to, the, to the British Fabian Society for I don't know how long, decades really. And uh, it's often occurred to me how do we find that space where we can talk about social democratic concepts um, and have it last and not just these foundations that come and go. And, and the thing that really spurred me on recently to see the way that New Zealand Institute, which I think had a reasonably independent uh, view being folded into a business round table and I kind of thought, is, you know, is that it? Uh, is, you know, what, what, what remains, what space remains for people to uh, present um, ideas um, uh, of, of a social democratic nature in an alternative forum? So um, the, these are, I have a, a, a folder, a little folder, and I chuck things into that and, uh, and then it gets to be about that size and I think, well, at that time I gave a talk. So uh, that's how the opportunity arose today. Thank you all for, 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 for coming along. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really going to only talk about the sort of four major um, kind of themes. Um, and as, as Mike and, and Chris have suggested, I've, I've sort of, uh, I'm a scribbler, you know, from way back. And I've, I've wasted lots of money on publishing books and things like that, which have never sold very well. Um, but I still keep thinking about these things. And today I just want to talk, carry out three, sort of four themes. Firstly, um, it's a slightly pessimistic one. Which is, um, you know, is is is, is the New Zealand uh, experiment a viable one? <laughs> and, and of course, you have to say yes. But, uh, in, in other respects, you you do wonder at times whether uh, where we are on the edge of, of the world, whether you know, how, how do we make a living? How do we find our way in the world? And that has huge impacts on us internally um, and, and how we are as a society. Secondly, there's something about social democracy and, and paganism. It's quite interesting. I went to London School of Economics, and the Webbs, who are founders of the of the Fabian Society pretty much established to London School of Economics because they had this very pointy-headed view, this sort of policy wonkish idea that if you had this, you could develop things rationally and produce policies that government might actually accept and the social sciences were part of that. And I actually feel there's something to that. And I'm a social scientist and I feel there is, there is a, 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 an element of that, of that kind. And I, I'm very much in that kind of Fabian tradition of you know thinking up things in the university, which I think can be can find policy space, and a lot of people can agree on, even though some may disagree with very strongly. And I think social scientists, allied to people of who are in social movements, can can find that, that particular that particular space. Thirdly, um, ideas from home and abroad. When you ransack around the place, you find there's lots of ideas about, and there's there's, there's quite a bit of common ground. Even though you might not hear that in the in the, the media here, but um, I, I've, I've brought together a number of of, of, of uh, uh, little lists and things from various sources, which actually suggest that actually there are, there are alternatives. They're quite viable. They don't require you to bust the bank, uh, and they 
they, they do provide um, you know, a, 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 a society that's at peace with itself, that doesn't have a, 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 an underclass forming, and that can pay its way in the world and have, an, and have a, a sense of independence. And finally, some gross modest proposals, some of which, which might be um, uh, a, a little bit um, uh, controversial, I'm not sure. Um, I've got a bit of street art, so this is just around the corner. Uh, I think that was painted by my uh, neighbour, Claudia Pondini, I'm not exactly sure. And that will be about 20 years ago, and it's still there. And it's still there, untagged. And the only things that are on it that shouldn't be there are these parking signs. But other than that, it's, it's as it was 20 years ago. And I have to go there about sort of early on a Sunday morning when the cars aren't parked and get a shot there. So, uh, I've got a couple more, um, slightly more alarming uh, pieces of art. So a pessimistic view would be, uh, as a colonial bench in New Zealand, there was always a chance in business. And when you think about it, it was amazing the, the uh, ambition of people who went as far as they possibly could from the major centres of the world uh, as it was at that time, and set up a new society, at least a new society uh, with indigenous peoples. And, uh, and, and um, they, they had, you know, when you think about it, Amazing sort of optimism, and then, then late people start to think about well, what is New Zealand's place in the world. We've had people like um, and such and others who felt that New Zealand could find its own uh, independent path, and people saw New Zealand as a sort of a Switzerland, the South Pacific, that, that could find a distinctive way, would, would uh, be um, not only Switzerland, uh, not, not necessarily Switzerland in the political sense, being neutral that was part of it, but also Switzerland and being. Um, up, up market now to produce products the world wanted and that was distinctive of its particular um, small social democratic nature, albeit of a South Pacific kind. So, but, but then uh, when, when you look at that, or more likely, what was, what was New Zealand's viability, even its sovereignty, likely to be in question? So when you look at it, the quest for security and others are, are in a way sort of saying, gosh, we can't make it. We've got to surround ourselves, we've got to have tariffs, we've got to have different ways to protect ourselves because actually we're so small, we've been tossed around by international um, uh, waves. Um, how are we going to, how are we going to survive, particularly when Mother, Mother Britain slipped away? Um, and uh, uh, yeah. so, so I, there are certainly times when, um, more recently, particularly, where I've, I've felt that, that sense again is that uh, uh, what independence can we, can we aspire to? And is, is this even a possibility? And I, I believe that social, the social democracy is one way of at least thinking about this. So what are the grounds for pessimism? Well, half a million New Zealanders in Australia. Uh, there's no evidence for breaking out of a low value commodity, despite we've had decades of debate about this. Most people seem to be agreed upon it. We don't quite know how to do it. We look at Finland, we look at Israel, we look at uh, other countries, Denmark, uh, other countries which have possibly come from un unpromising circumstances and somehow been able to get uh, a self-sustaining cycle of, of, of uh, uh, you know, um, items that are, are, are of higher value. Um, and yet we still seem to be um, stuck with the milk price. Um, that seems to be the thing that, that uh, is, is important for an item. Uh, and, and, and I've got nothing wrong with the milk price, just think with which we have the added value to the milk price. So that other people aren't making it on the milk powder. And we're, you know, where is the Nestle? That's what I've always felt talking about Switzerland. I've always thought, where is the Nestle? We really should, should have had and should be having an equivalent to Nestle building on our amazing, uh, you know, um, uh, fundamental um, <coughs> primary, primary products. We seem to have a structural deficit, um, and when you look at it, uh, just seeing um, uh, Will, Will Rosenberg in here, his, his father was a great. Uh, was actually quite pessimistic about New Zealand's opportunities and felt that really New Zealand needed to, to, to have a, an import control system because otherwise there was inevitably a structural deficit will forever uh, having to work, losing um, assets and the like in order to maintain or in order to be able to maintain our standard of living. And that seems to be what, what we're, we're in that pattern at present. Um, so I, I find that, you know, um, Sort of worry that we might end up like Nauru, where we've got rid of all the um, <laughs> all the guano, and we're just left with this little coral in the, in the South Pacific, and everyone's bought everything else off us. Uh, I mean, certainly hasn't got anywhere to close that. But certain, and, and at times you might think it's good to have in foreign investment. Foreign investment actually is is somehow helping us do better, um, but that doesn't seem to be the case in many instances. It's usually buying viable businesses and and, and uh, 
not necessarily at, uh, starting new businesses, which actually might make a difference. Although, you know, there's plenty of examples. And I must say, one of the things that really, really has, has bothered me is, 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 is that at times is that we, we, we can't even control our, our own way of looking at ourselves, the media and broadcasting. It's sort of as a, I, I've kind of thought, in, if we can't even keep some sort of public sector broadcasting thing going, where, which at least allows us to control our destiny culturally and then reflect that back, with Maori television being, frankly, an example of how we could do it uh, on a national scale. So it sort of it sort of bothers me that we've allowed some of these things to slip away, and maybe it doesn't matter too much in Zealand, so I'm not sure. So, you know, it's a pessimistic view. So one bleak, bleak view of the future would be a lovely country still, but our best and brightest are overseas. <coughs> no strategic assets are foreign control. Our media is reduced to tabloids and talkback. We're an efficient but simple commodity producer. We find it difficult to support world-class institutions. When I hear my vice chance to say we need more money for the Auckland University, or when I hear that people say we need more money for the hospital, I say, I know, guys. But actually, New Zealand is finding it difficult to afford these things. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and we actually do incredibly well, given our resource base. I mean, Auckland, you know, which I'm uh, at, you know, when you look at it internationally, given this resource base, is doing well. And the VC is always asking for more, but I think to myself, actually, if the University of Auckland could help New Zealand uh, build more viable businesses, that would be, the, and possibly get equity in them and all those sort of things, that would be the way in which it could grow itself with growing New Zealand. And I'm not saying that ambition isn't there, and it's not an easy thing to do, but uh, it seems to me that's one option we should, we should have. Similarly with the health sector, we do amazingly well. Um, with our, our limited resource, but actually it's getting harder and harder to do. So it's hard for us to support world-class institutions. Our worry of solidifying underclass, um, and in many respects, underclass is buttressed by other what I call lifestyle demons. We've got alcohol, we've got obesity, we've got um, drugs, uh, we've got a whole a number of things which actually are sort of confirming these other socioeconomic differences, which makes it hard to break out of them. It isn't just redistributing income as it was in the past, although that would be a nice thing to do. Uh, it's also the other things that are confirming these disadvantages in the multi multiplicity of ways it's making the term child to break, break up. Um, a, a diminishing productive sector, and what worries me is that guys like me will be sticking around growing super and there'll be young people and there'll be nobody in the middle because <laughs> they're all somewhere else. So anyway, and, and the All Blacks looking in the future will have never regain the World Cup. No, that's just a, a joke, really. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in, I'm looking at a great uh, future, obviously, they hold it now. But, uh, yeah. So, you know, that's a bleak view, and, and uh, I'm overstating it, but certainly there are times when I do, I do that, that does cross my mind, it worries me, and, uh, and I think, uh, what can I as a, you know, a patriotic New Zealander, and not a populist uh, uh, one, but one somebody thinking, what is it that society has its strengths on its side that it actually you could do? Uh, and, and do it in a way that it was socially uh, beneficial um, and, and also economically viable. And when you look at some of the models around the world, you find, um, you know, if you look at the Nordic countries, they're highly competitive economically, but sometimes they somehow they're maintaining socially just society. So that formula is possible. And, and, and a lot of them look at Norway, they came out of nothing, just got fishing. Um, admittedly, they found oil, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we might find some too. <laughs> but they sensibly, not like the oh, yeah. who blew the oil, they've invested it in, in, a, in, a, in a sovereign wealth fund. You know, how brilliant. So, you know, so they actually, they're not raiding it. They're saying it's there. And in fact, they know damn well if they import it, the country will blow inflation out. So, they're, they're, you know, it's just so sensible. So, uh, but basically, it's a fishing country. It's farmers and fishermen and wood, wood people and out of that they built one of the countries with the highest income in the world. So, you know, it has to be possible. Okay, so that's me, that's maybe this is a demonistic sort of pessimistic, this is another, uh, this guy could be got a problem, I don't know. But that, that's, uh, as you can see, there's the car parks there and, uh, and so I have to go there on Sunday morning and get a shot of this guy and that's uh, our key to cities, so I'm not sure what that means. Just breaking it up. And so that's a pessimistic view um, of the future, and I'm, I'm hoping that, that social democracy might, uh, or social democratic views of the world, might help us sort of find a way through. So, just to say something about social democracy and Fabianism, um, the funny thing about the Fabians, I mean, I guess you know the, the origins of it, but when they, they, they looked at it, they saw themselves as being between the third way between basic fair capitalism, which would be seen around them, people like Booth and others were finding poverty in, in, in London in the late 19th century. On the other side, they had authoritarian state 
uh, state socialism has, has, has uh, emerged and, um, and, and seemed to be the, 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 the real alternative. And they were kind of you know, middle class intellectual people who were looking for alternatives. Uh, and they thought they found them, George Bernard Shaw and others, and they saw, you know, Quintus Fabius Maximus. I mean, imagine who else would have dreamed up this about apart from the late 19th century English intellectuals, uh, you know, looking, looking for a classics analogy and finding that Quintus Fabius Maximus, uh, uh, who, who won all his battles by gradualism. And so they argued that gradualism was the way, and social democracy, in essence, although nobody actually got in sure used the term at the time. But they saw that that was the way, parliamentary road, and the gradualist road, road and the rationalist road, which is kind of when you think about it, um, you know, pie in the sky. But actually, sometimes when you've got to believe in these things, um, that somehow um, rationalism and a rational way of looking at the world, trying to sort out the options and all that, trying to persuade people actually can work their way through. So they, they were a, 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 a sort of a, a, I wouldn't say a lone voice, but um, there was certainly too much, and New Zealand, of course, was a radical, in many ways, reflected the radicalism of uh, you know, English people, British people trying to get away from class structure and stuff, came to New Zealand, wanted to make their way. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's funny, you know, Helen's uh, uh, grand grandfather, you know, they, were, they came from the Yorkshire sort of mills and stuff, and, uh, and cut down wood and built up a farm and then they still vote they were all their sons voted Tories once they started voting the farm. So you know, you saw that they, they but the original guys were were, you know, uh, they were voting people and then and then you could see how the, you know, once you controlled land and all that, you you had a you know a different view of the world. So so New Zealand took part of that. Um, and then uh, and in fact uh, Australia had the first Labour governments in, in, in the world, and, and when you look at Labourism in Australia, it was also a, a form of nationalism, as I see it, a form of national expression, um, particularly of a more male type, you know, sort of a makeshift in Labourism and nationalism. But I don't think we, we had much of that, we had a different um, uh, sort of tenor. Uh, in the second half of the 20th century, I think you can see the heyday of social democracy, where both right and left sort of bought into it. Um, in, in the UK, you had this grand sort of consensus, you had um, but scholarism, you had Gates School on one side and Butler on the other, you know, left and right, and they basically agreed on the same things. Um, you had the welfare state, which they agreed on, you had Keynesianism, and really that was the sort of the heyday of, of, of what you might call a, a compact between the working class voters and, and, and a portion of the middle class, um, and yet a beneficent welfare state, and, you know, and all was apparently good. <laughs> In the world, um, and Ultra, when it all broke down, it could have been the oil shots, it could have been uh, um, uh, individualism, it could have been uh, uh, the, the breakdown of the manufacturing sector, which sustained the working class base. I I'm not sure, but um, um, once you get to the, the, the 21st century, I feel a lot of, there has been a lot of doubts. There's, the, the, at one time, there was practically no social democratic gov uh, governments in Europe, um, and, and uh, yeah. people started to wonder is, is there actually an alternative? Um, the, the neoliberal frame, the value retail, all the way that's all the world's uh, looked at, there really isn't an alternative. Um, and, and, you know, there have been doubts, the rise of individualism, inequality seems to be embedded. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so there's certainly been doubts about whether a, a, an alternative is, is available, and I think, I think frankly it is. But it's got to be done in a different way, and environmentalism has emerged, it's drawn off a lot of energy. Uh, feminism, none of these things are sort of potentially drawing people away, but they could actually you know, draw them together as well. And there hasn't been that solid you know, uh, reliance we could have on a kind of socio-economic kind of differential in society to help sort things out. It's got a lot more complicated. So um, uh, I, 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 I'm just going to bring up, I mean, I'm, I'm presenting myself, not as a third way person, but I think there are, there are I think we have, well, there are some things that I find thoroughly um, you know, um, puzzling in New Zealand context, for example, the ideological links of the right. I mean, I, I'm staggered how he let things like an asset bubble get away on us in the 2000s. How he allowed fraud in the finance companies. I mean, I, I remember seeing those ads where this, this kid, kid was sitting there with this huge apple on his head, and there was William Tell firing, and you can't miss, you know, and I remember seeing, oh yeah, God, that's probably worth putting money into, or, you know. And so we, we, you know, who was looking after us? This is what I find staggering that we, we set up what I assume were, were good economic fundamentals, and yet uh, they, they hadn't, um, somehow or other, 
Uh, it's too hard for politicians. You can't imagine politicians say, sorry, you can't have mass. You can't put money into houses. But they'd be up, you know, the next election. So it's damn hard for the politicians to deal with. We actually need some other entity, which I would assume the kind of reserve bank with expanded powers, uh, which actually understood a broader concept of its role. Some entity of that kind that actually could say, yes, actually, we do, this, this asset bubble is getting problematic because what we're doing is going to get a doubling in the prices of houses and we actually haven't achieved a thing um, in the meantime. So, you know, these, these are, can't be the right thing uh, economically. And I'm not an economist, but, you know, I'm just a, a lay person who thinks about it. So, you know, I find it puzzling. The fraudulent finance companies, I can't believe that we saw that was going on. Um, the huge private debt, I remember people saying, listen, that is private debt. You know, in the past, the problem was public debt. And I, I find it, yet, yet now that seems problematic, as you can see. You know, and at the time, I thought to myself, and this is just my own lay understanding, I can't believe that's right. So it just worries me that, 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 we, we, that the, the level of economic debate is, is, isn't sufficiently sophisticated to be able to draw up real alternatives in these areas. And I don't mean way off, off, the, off the, uh, uh, the compass sort of um, alternatives. I mean, you know, sensible alternatives, which actually sometimes here debated in, in other settings in Europe, for example. Um, isn't he's going to dodge a lot? I don't know. But I, I, uh, I think that it, it is possible to think about what, what, what level would your dollar need to, your, your, your currency need to be in order to ensure that you could actually employ your people and not have a, a, a consistent deficit. And that, for me, would be, it wouldn't be, does the world think it's right? I mean, it's actually, can New Zealand sustain you know, a reasonable level of employment with non-inflationary growth and not have a constant struggle on deficit? It seems to me that has to define where your dollar's got to be. How do you do that's another question, but I mean, I, I, I can't believe that that is the its own debate. Um, that it isn't something that, that it, it is something that you can see as a social good um, that that should be a target. Um, the collapse and disrepair of technical trade training is a real worry to me. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a university person, but I reckon we put too much emphasis on academic uh, stuff. Um, and uh, you know, when you look at we, we're having to import all our our technical people, and we got people out of work who. Uh, and when you look at a lot of the, the, the kids who are not doing well at school, the kind of kids, boys, Maori, Pacific Island boys, who love to do things with their hands. And, and I, I'm not quite sure why, why that isn't happening. Um, but, you know, because I don't believe anyone wants that. So it's sort of puzzling to me that we get these, these policy failures of some kind. And it's, struck, it's sort of puzzling to me that that's partly the reason why I think we ought to have some kind of forum of this kind. I also think this is going to be a future oriented institute of some kind. We've lost the, the old um, uh, Commission for the Future and the Planning Institute. Maybe they were out of time, but frankly, we've got no one properly thinking about the future in, in, in the long haul. I'm worried about trust that shelter people who should be paying and contributing towards maintaining the civilized society which they enjoy. Uh, it does it, it amaze me that it's, it's still actually quite easy. And then I think there are lifestyle patterns which we don't know how to deal with. We don't know how to deal with gambling, with alcohol, with obesity. Uh, drugs, these things, we, we, we get there are popular things, we know if we, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, the alcohol thing, how do you deal with that without upsetting half the population, <coughs> all the blokes, for example, um, uh, the, the obesity thing, how do you get, you know, you know uh, I mean, these things have been started, but I, I, I kind of worry that sometimes, I remember seeing a, a, a column by, by Brian Easton in the, in the listener where he said the 10 problems that were in the too high basket. Uh, and I thought that was absolutely right because, uh, and there were ones that I, I, I could have thought about that actually the governments find hard to deal with because, because e even governments of either side, because, uh, and, I, and I'm not arguing that it should be, uh, I'm more worried about governments that are centre dealing with these things, that actually they find it hard to deal with because they're unpopular and yet in the long run they actually are the right thing to do in many respects. So um, uh, something like, you know, capital gains tax, I mean, that, you know, for a long time that's very hard to do because that can upset a whole lot of people. So, um, so anyway, I, I, what worries me is who, who is looking out on these things? And, and it does surprise me that we haven't had better service, in my view anyway, as a, you know, a naive, naive kind of observer uh, of, 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 of the world and a reader of things like Financial Times and Economist and all the rest of it, where I try to draw these threads together, I'm surprised that given our vulnerability as a small little country living in the South Pacific, I would have thought we'd been a lot more hard on this issue and we'd say we can't allow this to go any we just we're bleeding too much of our strength. We can't allow an asset bubble like this. We can't allow Gordon Fanatz to come to the police people. 
can't have huge private debt which then is going to come home to roost. So it, it is amazing to me that we've allowed our vulnerability, which is already there, as I said, with that pessimistic picture, to be added to by human fail, human action. And this, this is what this is what sort of worries me. I must say this a social fact. Point of view or even a uh, left left wing or right wing point of view. But I think there are ideological blinkers for left too. Um, there are poverty we have in political lexicon, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I remember for a long time, I remember, I remember people used to write the poverty museum, that guy, yeah, the social credit guy, I don't remember his name, and, then, and there were um, uh, others who, who, who talked about it, and, and I think it's important, and did bring out to the political, political lexicon, but, um, you know, and I'm talking here in spite, um, as, as somebody who felt, who, who works for what is possible, and, and what is social justice as well. Um, and, and I was a bit worried that it became a, a stick to beat um, governments with, even though those governments are trying their darkest. Um, and, and that uh, when you, for example, when you look at the uh, report by the OECD in 2007, and it looked, it looked at countries like New Zealand, Australia, um, what are called Anglo Saxon countries, and, it's, and, and it, I mean, it could be wrong, but I thought here's, here's a point of view. It would be relatively easy for lone parents and couples to exit poverty in New Zealand. And it, and it outlined a number of minimum wages, tax and benefit policies and entry into work. I've never heard that discussed. I've never heard that put up as an option. What I heard it put up as an option was uh, things that were actually way outside, well, well sort of almost uh, bracketed away. Active, this is basically active labor market policy. Right? This is what other, other um, social democratic governments do. And in, in the Nordic countries, right wing governments have taken over that sort of deal. Um, and, and they argue that fairly incremental policy changes could be very effective at reducing property rates significantly. Well, you know, I never, I never heard that. Uh, what I heard was, was there were catastrophic levels of poverty in New Zealand uh, and that we were never going to be able to eradicate them. And I thought at some point there was a danger that this was becoming way a stick to beat governments rather than actually a problem that we actually could deal with um, and with goodwill. Uh, and that, that was my, my thought, worry then. I actually, actually started, stopped talking and thinking about this area because it was almost impossible to do, do it without uh, feeling that you, you might get offside uh, and be seen as some you know, harsh kind of neoliberal. And I, I, I don't disagree with, I, I don't disagree with um, my friend uh, Mike Smith to say there's been 20 years of neoliberalism. I mean, I think I mean, there's been nine years of different government. Um, so I, I think the word neoliberal has been used far too loosely. I don't quite know what it means myself. Uh, but it, it is applied to everything that you don't like, almost. And I, and I believe that they, if, if you do that, it's thoroughly pessimistic. And, and uh, it means that virtually nothing else is possible. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that um, there, there, you know, there, 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 we, we, we trap ourselves in that way. Um, I actually won't show you this one, but um, this, I think it's getting too... Well, I might, uh, uh, this is just a, an article uh, in Social Science and Medicine, which I'm associated with, where they looked at inc income inequality related infant mortality. Um, and what they find is there's a strong relationship between infant mortality and inequality. It's sort of, you know, getting up to one, uh, and then it drops down. It's still very strong. Um, but then when you use a different analysis, you find that actually within countries, um, it doesn't necessarily hold that way. In New Zealand, it's very strong. We're, we've got uh, the highest relationship between inequality. Um, we, we've got high inequality, but we've got low infant mortality. That's what the minus one means there. So we actually, even though we're an equal society, there are some things that we're able to do in the welfare state. Um, I believe that are able to deal with some of these issues. We don't have to accept them as being, um, you know, the final word. Um, that's another piece of artwork around um, uh, uh, Kingsland. And again, what a riot! You know, that's, that was normally, a, as you can see, a, um, a, a horrible sort of brick wall. And this guy, somebody, has come to town. <laughs> done a lot of uh, a lot of work uh, on it. So those those are uh, firstly a, pes a pessimistic view, and secondly a little bit about social democracy and how I, I feel at least my version uh, it is, is is sort of tries to to, to steer it sort of a, a, a little way, um, and that I'm still I believe in the art of the possible, and that social democratic view does provide an alternative as an anti and to label everything neoliberal is, is problematic because then there's no political space left. Yeah, it might be anyway. so, so, so now I'm going to go on and talk about some, some uh, ideas from, from different, different sources. And, uh, and, and when you look at them all together, there's, there's, a, there's a whole bloody policy package there, might be. I think working for families was a, a big idea because it, it, apart from anything else, it hit multiple policy targets. 
One thing I think the clever governments do is they do something that hits a number of policy targets simultaneously. Um, and so it, it, it recognised, for example, that family work imposes costs. People who raise families have extra costs. And, and quite aside from the social justice thing, there's also a hard-headed thing. Is if we don't reproduce society, um, we're, we're going to have demographic ageing. We're actually going to decline. We actually, we actually need to reward people who are prepared to raise kids. I don't have kids, and I'm amazed at people who do. I think they're doing a great job. Uh, you know, how they manage the school holidays and all the rest of it, I don't know. But I, I think it's fantastic. Uh, and I think the fact that they get rewarded for it, particularly the low-income people, uh, for whom it must be even harder, I think it's great. Uh, secondly, employment had to be made to pay, to pay and also help low-income mothers in particular to get them to work. So I, I felt it, 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 it hit a number of policy targets. And for me, that's the best kind of policy. It's one that can be defended on a number of grounds, and, and then you get, you get a, a parsimonious sort of uh, approach. Kiwi saver, I think. I mean, you know, you would never get, get that out of a, of a current minister. Finance first. I mean, really. I mean, this is. I, I just think uh, Michael Cullen will go down the street and one, one of the great treasurers. I think he really had some brilliant ideas. And he knew, even the treasury didn't, that New Zealand had a poor saving habit. You know, it's still denied by all sorts of people who otherwise I would respect and say people uh, New Zealand has. And also the other brilliant thing is it's a sort of natural philosophy. It almost made it impossible for people not to be in key saver. You know, which I think was so brilliant. And, and uh, admittedly, it required a lot of bribery, you know, a lot of uh, you know tax credits and all the rest of it. But you know, I, I just think that's uh, in many ways we've got to think of ways of interventionism that people almost, despite themselves, have to end up doing it if you can. Um, because if you end up with a with a, 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 a baseball bat trying to back up people to do things, they would they reject it. But if you could make it so so uh, uh, subtle and easy that they actually do things despite themselves. And end up thinking, God, that's good. Yeah, I've made some savings. Oh, fantastic. So, you know, I, I just thought it was a brilliant concept. And if we can use that kind of nudge philosophy in other areas. Thirdly, New Zealand's superannuation fund. Now, I remember seeing the great debates in Australia at the time in the 1970s about how this concept of how to buy back the farm. Um, and actually, they got a bit of strike at that time. They got money from dodgy characters. But I think that partly laid, be laid behind the Hawke government's introduction of contributory superannuation. It was also a deal with the unions because they wanted. They didn't, again, it was like an asset bubble thing. They wanted the money not to go into houses and stuff, but to go into savings. Um, at least that's my reading of it. And they want Australia to be more independent, uh, buy back the farm. Um, and so, uh, you know, and so even, you know, the Great Dominion Post, I remember, had a headline saying, give us back our money in this, in this city uh, in, in, in the 2000s. And instead, it's there in New Zealand superannuation, and we're all, I hope, um, sort of reasonably happy about that. I thought it was a brilliant concept. So I, I think it's still possible for uh, New Zealand government to come up with good ideas and do good things. There isn't an economic uh, saving uh, saviour there, but there's a whole lot of things that I'm looking for. Well, the Economic Forum, uh, which um, you might not think of as Davos, why would things happen there? Well, the Employment and Social Protection Council, they argue for targeted investments in infrastructure, finance high growth, small and medium enterprises, more progressive taxation, take taxation away from employment, uh, tax cuts and income transfers should be oriented as low income groups as they'll spend it. Uh, and it's only a, not only a just thing, it makes sense economically because then you, get, you, you keep demand up. Um, robust minimum wage laws, but otherwise, with this huge, um, these, these huge inequalities going on, you get wage inflation and falls down. Uh, particularly more investment, investment in active labour market policies and flexible schemes for job retention. So they, you know, there are packages out there uh, which uh, are, are defensible at the World Economic Forum, although I must say this is probably a little bit of a, a breakaway movement, where ma mainly people from the, uh, refugees from the ILO and people and, and, uh, and, and the head of the uh, International Trade Union Congress, um, Chairman mm. Robert Burroughs and people like that are there. So, but, but nevertheless, that voice has been, has been you know, and those, those, those policies are being, are being promoted. And I think, you know, there's a package that one, one, could, one could work out. Australia's worth a lot. Uh, and here's more social policies. I think Medicare, social insurance, the general practice. We still have general practices, family, family doctors. It's still basically, you know, um, a bit of a mess. Uh, and uh, it was the Whitman government that introduced Medicare. Um, and uh, that was a, a, a levy on and social insurance. Actually, it's not a million miles from ACC, and that's why I, I like that aspect of ACC is social insurance. And if you can move that over and, 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 and widen that to cover um, primary care, you, you, would have, you would have done it. Contributory superannuation. I don't like the idea of compulsory superannuation. It's contributory. Um, I don't like, you know, because we we've got compulsory superannuation now, it's through our taxes. 
Um, you know, I, I, I think what I like about this, and I think it's much easier to defend social um, uh, uh, institutions, particularly if people can see they contribute in some way to them, they own it. It's harder for others to destroy them. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, the, the contributory principle in social insurance, that kind of concept, I think, is what we're talking about. We have very little in this country apart from ACC. State, state support for parties and elections. Again and again, I see the Herald and my, my great CEO going on about how the pretty cool politician taking money from people. And then when you say, well, then how about, how about the state contributing? No, no, we can't have that. So, you know, politicians are put in an impossible position. They have to get money to run elections. We see all over the world politicians getting into trouble uh, because they have to run elections, they have to find money somewhere. And then they're, and then they're berated for doing so. So, you know, we put people in, I, I believe the political process is still in a kind of a, you know, frontier mentality. And they still need maybe a decent public broadcasting centre, and they have a carbon tax. I just word the look. I don't say we've got the more. Um, learning from the Nordic, Nordic model. Well, what, the thing I like about the Nordic model, and we're not Nordic, so let's remember that. But um, um, they are open competitive economies, and they're pretty damn tough. And they've been through uh, the times of the 1990s. They had to do lots of things which are relatively unpalatable, um, but they managed to maintain their social um, um, sort of fabric, you might say. And so in, in the, they, they, they were open and competitive kind of, they had to do lots of things to sort of um, get through the 1990s. And the areas that I find of particular interest is active labor market. That really seems to be a fundamental way in which they, they, they maintain um, so, social harmony and, and un, underpinning uh, of the standard of living of the population. So, and, and uh, it costs money. It, it means that you actually have to train people. It means you, you have to, um, provide them with uh, childcare so they can actually take work. And all sorts of things actually, it, it does re require um, you know, uh, funding. Not, not huge amounts, I and mean, I think we're not a million miles away from that. Um, but we've just got to see it um, in, in, a, in a, they've got a, a, a very different attitude to high, school, high skills, they've got high employment of women, and also their attitude, their, the teams, they, they, you know, what you've got to accept with this Nordic model is, I'm afraid, is paternalistic. Uh, it's possibly even coercive. So, for example, uh, their sole parents are, are have to look, look for work way, way uh, sooner than ours did. We're getting close to that. But they could count on childcare and other things which they could, they could trust. Um, so they weren't being thrown, thrown out. So they, they, there is you know, social implicit social contract there. But with the teens, for example, um, they're the vocational. Um, much greater emphasis on vocational aspects of education. They just don't allow kids to fall out. The local government, they actually give, a number of them give uh, uh, responsibilities to the local government. They say, actually, now you've got a whole lot of kids in your area, just got to make sure they don't slip through the cracks. Uh, keep, you know, they even have lists of them, probably, you know, per perish the thought. But actually, if you don't do that, they, they do. Uh, they play hockey, they disappear, they go to Australia, we can't think about that, but um, uh, <laughs> um, they come back. Uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, there are things where they've actually managed to keep their uh, unemployment among teens uh, in, in, in a number of uh, Nordic countries quite well. Um, the OECD, they've got a recent publication on divided we stand. They say inequality is on the rise in most OECD countries. There's a ratio now of 9 to 1 between the richest and poorest 10%. And there's a convergence of higher and lower inequality countries. But actually, they come up with a whole series of strategies. They say, we can, we can, we can tackle, we can, we can have a go at this. We need more intensive human capital. In other words, a lot of you know people who don't have the skills need to be assisted in gaining the skills so they can remain in contact with the labor market. We need inclusive employment, employment promotion so that people who have other difficulties, like having to raise the family or whatever, aren't sort of shunted aside. And well-designed tax transfer redistribution policies. So, and they, they, the, so I, I just put that up because that's the OECD, which is the think tank for the developed countries, and you might think it's the half of neoliberalism. And yet it's coming up with, with I think, reasonably defensible policies. Uh, for a, 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 an area of concern that we would all share, you know, just actually worry about inequality. They can see it as problematic. They can see it as bad socially and encouraging pop, uh, political extremism, all sorts of things. So they can see it. So, you know, it's, it's curious that this would be, you know, uh, the, the kind of uh, the, the, the seat of neoliberal thought you might have thought, you might have felt within the rich countries, and yet they are taking the seat. Two ideas from the Fabians. I've got, um, I'm a member of the Fabian Society, 
Hopkins and Fabian Review and a little book here called The Shape of Things to Come that arrived since last week. Um, just throw out Peter Kellner, who used to be a uh, new statesman who I think runs his own um, sort of uh, opinion polling kind of thing. Um, and he, he, he's worried about the way in which the British public is falling out of favour with the welfare state. You know, what is going on here? They've, they've been fed this diet, bludgers and all the rest of it through the tabloids. But he, he believes there is a point that the key to reviving popular support for decent welfare provision is to re-establish the insurance link. He argues that when you look at it, it was uh, the, it was actually liberal thinkers. Keynes was a liberal thinker, um, the, the, the architect of many of the British welfare state, the main state in the present. Uh, liberal, yeah. So you know, he brought so that was a, and that came that came in with uh, you know that was before the latest landslide. So and that, that would maintain it. So in a way, it hit a dead center in the same way I think ACC when it was introduced it hit the dead center between left and right. Um, and so you know, he argues that that then what becomes more defensible. You know, if you have some sort of underlying social insurance principle, I'm not sure how far you can spread it. We don't have that uh, history here. Um, Kate Green, now I think she was in property action before she went into Parliament. Um, and so I was surprised, to, uh, uh, pleasantly surprised to see this because she said there is, there might be <laughs> room for a welfare bargain. So if we balance guarantees, and this is really a Nordic bargain, um, on pay, hours, access to skills, universal childcare, housing on one hand, with an obligation to take suitable employment in the other. So, you know, there's the first income. That and I and I feel that in, you know we this is this sort of paternalistic view. It's sort of a social contract that could be coercive, could be seen as coercive, mm -hmm. or could be seen if you move with this group of people as something that's a reasonable uh, trade-off. We'll 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 provide all the, the support systems you need, but we do expect that you'll raise your skills and you try to get work, and we want you to get work because that's the way in which we can ensure that um, you become independent and self-sustaining for the long-term future. And we will do other things like maintaining high level of demand and an exchange rate that will allow us to maintain industries and so on. Okay, so that, that's another um, uh, little, uh, that's, the, that's the railway, so Kingsland Station, and there's another brick wall and there's another piece of work. So this last, Portion. I'm just going to talk about um, some modest proposals, um, and um, so I, I, I'm wondering about superannuation problems with the current system. Is it sustainable? I hear all sorts of people saying it still is, and others think it's not. Uh, it worries me that it crowds out other areas of social investment that actually can't invest in anything, in anything else anymore, than except with much greatly increased uh, taxation. And we may have discouraged savings. I, I'm quite interested in the Swedish system, which I think, I might be wrong here, I'm kind of a bit of a, a, a jackdaw here. I, I've sort of picked up things around the place, or main parties of the right expression. Um, they, they, they have, I think, have a hybrid system where it's part contributory and part tax based. And, and I think that's where, where we may end up, I mean, you know, where, where we've got this tax based foundation, and, then, and that basically the Kiwi Saver becomes a compulsory, you know, a second tier thing, which in, in, uh, you know, we get a hybrid, possibly hybrid system. Um, I, I, I don't know. But in the Swedish system also, they took years. They started to do the equivalent of NZ superannuation. They told people, uh, here's your little account. You can't draw anything from it, but just look at it. There it is. There's the money in the system. You can't draw it out. It's been built up over time. And, and when you when you come to retire, you'll be able to access it. So, you know, a bit like Kimi Saving in a way, so the people go, oh, okay, yes. Uh, there is there is there, there is this money here and, and I have contributed to it in the time it will come my way. And so they actually they gave people um, kind of slightly fake accounts, as I understand it. You weren't looking at how they did it, but it required a lot of um, you know public discussion. Um, I won't go into my uh, idea about the current system. I, I, I was just thinking that actually you could raise the age of 70 and then you could say uh, offer everyone a minimum income guarantee and say uh, if if you stay in work. And your income is below the national super, we'll top it up. Uh, and, and if you leave work uh, and, and you need an income guarantee, we'll give it to you anyway. Because what worries me about giving people some renovation, they'll, um, they'll actually say, well, um, well, I'll just stay in work. In fact, we want people to possibly stay in work, you might do, because it's actually good for your health, unless it's unhealthy. Uh, and also because uh, you, know, you, you, you know, retain job skills and the like. But I won't go uh, in any more detail on that. Uh, ACC. 
Look, I'm, I'm worried. Um, I think we should go Australian, and I, you know, it's a funny concept, but I think ACU has become too highly politicised to become political football, even though it was meant to be reasonably independent. Um, and, you know, you'd have to wonder about the long-term viability. If it's chopped around, the employers say that the, the charge is too high and they reduce them, then it becomes, then it becomes financially unviable. And the main thing, the way I've seen it, one of the things I've seen, it drives a wedge through the health and disability system, because instead of people saying, I've got a health problem uh, and I need help, they say, uh, I'm trying to prove I've had an accident so that I can get help. And I think, well, that's absolutely wrong. What you should be proving is that you've got a health problem that needs attention. And so the ACC has, 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 has pushed this wedge right through the system. And I think what we should do is what Australia, Australians are trying to do, which they probably won't get to. It's a national disability insurance scheme for people with disabilities. And naturally, on the one side, they could be work-related, they could be anywhere related. The trouble is you've got to have an accident, you see, on the ACC to get you know, disability support. So could be a, a national disability insurer. And then I, I believe that the the, um, the, the the health thing should be folded back into the health system. Uh, and, and so that instead of going to the GP and saying, can you prove I've got an accident so you can you can cut, I, I don't have to pay a fee. You say, hey GP, I've got a problem. I, I realize we've got this thing called Medicare that covers everything. Um, and I'm happy I don't have to prove I've had an accident to do so. So you know, I, I feel that would be one way in which we could solve the problem of actually all of all um, proper healthcare outside the hospitals, in, 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 in which is basically the Australian side of the and it wouldn't be hard to do. Um, economic initiatives, uh, I've been quite intrigued about a transactions tax, and um, but I, I don't really know enough about it. But I've seen uh, people in Europe discuss it seriously, and uh, what 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 I, I want whether it could be linked. To currency trades, so that um, so that you could you could have the the, the transaction tax could be higher outside uh, a preferred New Zealand dollar band. I, I don't know. It just seems to me that we New Zealand dollar is one of the most highly um, uh, um, most, most highly traded uh, currencies, and we get no benefit. <laughs> um, uh, I think we should be. I'm worried the banks are not particularly interested in investing in business, as far as I can tell. Um, we do. I, I wonder whether we need to go back to the old BFC or some kind of you know, state investment bank. We need an agency for small businesses. Uh, I'm not sure that's happening at present. But these are just ideas. Um, I, I wonder whether the Frontera monopoly can continue. I, I believe, I, I'm not sure they've delivered on it. I'm not sure they can. Um, I don't want to undermine his in position to sell its milk adequately, so I'm, I'm sort of cautious about this, but I do believe that the way in which the milk price is set means that it's hard for people to come in um, and, and, uh, and and try other things to add value, which is where we would want. And I, I don't believe Frontier is really, at least I've not seen any progress in that area. I'm amazed we don't have the Frontier All Blacks, for example. <laughs> imagine that as a way to sell sell your products internationally, your Nestle All Blacks, just imagine it. So, uh, you know, get strong on uh, cal cal calcium milk or something like that. I mean, you know, we've, I've never seen them uh, support anything in New Zealand. And I've often wondered why that is. Uh, because we've got international teams and it seems striking to me. The only one I ever remember, remember the uh, Apple and Pear board used to support um, old um, Peter, uh, Peter Blake. He went on that end of thing. And that's about the only, only of these guys I've seen actually use one of those. And it's sort of, it's sort of, it suggests that they're not ambitious about adding value and using promotion activities uh, internationally. Um, uh, I, um, I, I actually, I felt the, the MED concept was a good one, and um, and it was very important to break the fact that Treasury was the only advisor on economic things. So that was good, but uh, now it's been folded into this other thing. I, I'm just not sure that's that's going to work. Work. It seems to me it's a, a mashup, um, and um, I'm worried that science is going to disappear from view. So I just wonder whether NCT and NED could, could work more together. They're both trying to do the same thing, one out of the seat and one term, and I just wonder whether there was more synergy one could have on that. Um, I think the Reserve Bank, something, somebody, some, somebody should be doing some of those expanded things I mentioned earlier on, asset bubbles, um, New Zealand dollar. Um, it's hard for governments to do that, and they shouldn't probably, because they do it for political reasons, and it's, you probably need when political probably need some other entity that will do that. So I, I'm, I'm quite keen that, that you know, I think it's worth thinking outside the box. Public sector reform for a small country, I think we've got far too many agencies, it's not popular, I guess. 
Um, but, um, and unfortunately the current <laughs> administration is taking this up, but the truth is we're at a time where we've kind of scattered our resources everywhere. Um, for example, I reckon we've got multiple standalone rights commissions. I reckon we've got a single human rights commission that could do a lot of that stuff, bring it all together. Um, we've got fragmented local government structure. Um, uh, I reckon the Health and Disability Commission has really proved, it, it, as, as an ombudsman for people, we've got grievances and we could extend that right across the health service. I don't think ombudsman's able to do that in the same way. But where people are expecting services, even whether it's corrections or whatever. Um, uh, I reckon we need a future oriented planning organisation of some kind. Um, and, and I think local government, I, I have to say that Auckland, I, I might be a minority on this, but I think the Auckland reorganisation has been transformative. And we now actually have an effective local government entity, you might not agree with it, but it's working itself through. Um, and, uh, and I feel we need more of them. And, and indeed, I reckon there ought to be a new, a new agreement between central governments that, okay, if you do sensible things like the mouth making, and all the rest of it, say so you've got proper critical mass, we'll allow you some form of autonomous fundraising in return for that, and we'll give you uh, certain powers and confidence that you can do. There needs to be something of that kind. Uh, why, you know, Wellington, you'll never, you'll never, you'll never do it while the, the parish farm people are, are at the helm. So um, that's Morningside Station. So finally, um, uh, I, I think in many ways, social democracy, I have given you a coherent uh, sort of, I've given you sort of thrown out some ideas. Um, I think there's a wealth, when you look around the world, of ideas that are perfectly um, acceptable and doable, we can forge them together. Um, our brand of social democracy will not be a European one, it will be our own, it will be distinctive. In fact, that's one of the big issues about the social democratic movement, how it gets beyond Europe. You know, the Africa, you know, the ANCs, the Indian Congress Party, and others, you know, the Latin American parties with a different dynamic. Um, Canada, you know, you can see all these you know, similar kinds of movements and, and all using similar concepts but uh, emerging in different ways. Ours would be multi multicultural, especially Maori on link. Um, oh, but I think we should still borrow from elsewhere. And I, and I do believe we need a viable forum or think tank, and I'm thinking quite seriously about how to um, set up some kind of foundation that uh, uh, I was uh, inspired by Dorothy Brown, who on $40,000 has managed to raise. $7 million to form a peace study center in Otago. I mean, you know, and there is, she's now passed away, but there was a woman with an idea who had $40,000 and she got various people together. And, that, and I think we dissipate our energies too much. I mean, something like the Baby Society, which is seen as a reasonably um, social democratic, but not partisan, uh, not party political, but uh, still, it, it's, you can still see where it sits, but it provides what it tries to provide a forum for, for discussion of, of ideas of the kind of outline to today. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for that. Um, would, would you like to take a question? Yeah, yeah, and, sure. And yeah, I yeah. think you're used to yeah, yeah. this kind of format. Yeah, so yeah. If you just people would like to ask questions, raise issues, debate and discuss. That's what we're here for. The floor's open. So who would like to start on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you teased me as I came around about import substitution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for me, um, I knew we'll follow it. I mean, to me, um, not necessarily a very good import substitution, but no. um, the, to me, the big challenge to, to social democracy, in particular a small country, a small remote country like New Zealand, yeah. is the whole issue of what's popularly called globalisation, yeah, yeah. the, open, the open economy and so on. And to me, that was... The, the, the last Labour government did a lot of good things. I think things like working for families and so on, it makes sense. But one of the things I think it really didn't cut the grips mm -hmm. was that whole tension between a high value, high wage economy mm -hmm. and the pressures of globalisation. And I just wondered um, if you've got any, uh, I, there's some things of that around the MED and stuff like yeah. that, but really, yeah. I mean, I think it needs a lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. brain power uh, and, and some pretty innovative yeah, yeah. I, I thought you and say you, thinking you, that. you wanted the previous government to inflict tariffs on us or something <laughs> like that. Because the thing that, that, that really reassures me is that when you look at the Nordic countries, they are open competitive economies. And somehow they've been able to combine that with being high standard of living. Uh, and some of them are, are resource poor. You wonder what they have, the Finlands and the Norways of this world. So 
I can't see why it can't be beyond us. And uh, I'm not sure how. I mean, we, you know, the number of people have um, um, asked these things, and, and um, um, uh, I and and I think, uh, for example, um, the previous government did try that sort of knowledge wave and things like that. I mean, and um, also I think the problem with this, this, the Fonterra thing is that we're locked into commodity production. I'm not quite sure how to do that without looking as though you've got it in for these outfits. You're trying to say, look, actually, what, you know, we, we still think you're doing a great job, and farmers do an amazing job when you think about it. It's not particularly for them to do, to do anything more, but somebody else has got to do something more. And I'm not sure what, what that is. I don't have any what, magic wrong, but I, don't, I wouldn't want to go back. I, I think the way to do the, the um, import thing is, is that the, the, the dollar needs to be at a level where we can viably set up uh, you know, alternative uh, industries, support our, our people, um, and, be, have, and not have a structural deficit, where we have to sell off assets in order to meet our, our standard of living. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I don't think there's any, any, any easy answer to that. But I, 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 globalization, uh, in the OEC report, they claim that globalization isn't the unalloyed concern that everyone claims it to be, that actually um, it, it does allow some things to happen better, even though it's threatening in other ways. Like, you know, we. A lot of our migrants, for example, only some, uh, they're not, no, in the old days, you used to get on a boat, and that was it. <laughs> but nowadays, you might come and then go back again, you know, and so, we, you know, it's, it's certainly thrown in a bit of the spanner and the works in all sorts of ways, but uh, I, I think overall, um, as long as we're in control of our own destiny, I think that's absolutely true. That's what was worrying me about the media thing, is that I, I can see this flipping on one, is that our ability to tell our own stories and control the way in which we and look at ourselves in the world, it's kind of slipping out of our hands. And I, and I would hope that, that, that New Zealand doesn't allow that to happen in too many areas. That's my concern with globalisation. Yeah. Oh, just, just taking up on that last point, mm -hmm. I wonder if New Zealand made a fundamental mistake as we phased out of tariffs and import licensing mm -hmm. when our response to uh, the, the pressures that came, then came upon us, we had two ways we could have gone. We could have gone for more capital mm. to improve labour yeah. productivity mm. and therefore the competitiveness in yeah. areas that were high value but low yeah. labour content. Mm. Or we could suppress wages and effectively yeah. go through the route that actually, yeah. in the end, proved to be a dead end. Yeah. But we kidded yeah. ourselves that if we suppressed wages and made people work harder, yeah. we would still have a manufacturing base. Yeah. And yeah. Perhaps the answer in redressing that mm. over time is to acknowledge that to mm. uh, to produce high value goods, you actually need a deeper capital base. Yeah, you need yeah. So that's you yeah, need that's to, right. You need to be, you need to be as we have given mm. away the things to China yeah. uh, that have got yeah. a high labour content that you can't produce yeah. at high value, yeah. which is what Germany's done. Yeah. But yeah. they have actually kept the high technical, high trade value. Yeah part of their economy through capital business. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. The one thing that sticks in my, my back in my memory is uh, is the last time we had major state investment was Think Big, you know, and it's got put a whole lot of people off the idea that governments can actually do things. I think governments can do things. I think obviously they've got to do more intelligently than was done then, but that was a sense of national urgency that we've got to invest in, you know, in creating our own energy sources and, and the like. So, um, and that, uh, I don't know where, where the capital base for that, but I entirely agree with you. We, we don't have an indigenous capital base, so we don't, don't have indigenous capitalists, you might say. <laughs> and we're, so I, I, yeah, I think that's part of the answer. Uh, plus, a, plus a smart government that that's realizes this and doesn't say hands off. And we also protected capital and didn't protect labor. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It wasn't about, it was, uh, it, it wasn't as a result of the oil shocks and all that, but we needed to invest in the alternative energy sources and the like. I kind of felt that was part of the environment. It might be part of the rationalisation, yeah. but it wasn't really part of a good wider analysis. Yeah. yeah. But, but on your, the um, deepening the capital yeah. base point, I think one of the things that's worth referring to is, is Paul Callaghan's vision, yeah. which you know starts with science, but science as a base, then he goes on as a base for higher value yeah. in industries. I mean, he explicitly says 
tear us on to the limit. Yeah. We can't go any further no. without you know, environmental disaster. Yeah. And in any case, it's, it's so valuated. You want to stand in other fields. And for him, that really means, I guess, two things. One is our education system, yeah. which I think has become run down, public mm -hmm. education, and that's a sort of beaver mm -hmm. to start with. Another one is uh, the training we're talking about. Yeah. But also just whether our top scientists want to work here or not. Yeah. And he brought them that into mm -hmm. saying, why would they want to come back to a country um, of great social inequality mm -hmm. where maybe the richer the educated communities and where the environment's being destroyed? Mm -hmm. So and I think sort of there is a vision there of how you might start to use some of the leaders that are available mm -hmm. to you. I don't know. I'm not enormously well, um, optimistic. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know whether scientists think that way, but I mean, um, I've been impressed that the Australians do have a repatriation scheme. Mm -hmm. they, they go around the world and they find Australian, top Australian scientists and say, will you come back and we'll give you a full fellowship and a position in X, Y, and Z. So they, I think they're much more canny about, uh, of course it's a wealthier country and they can afford to do that, but I, I feel um, we, we sort of uh, partly left it a bit, a bit less affair, and we're not entirely sure what the payoff would be. I mean, uh, Australia, I think, is large enough to have people who are in pure science and others who are more in applied, and, and if you say, okay, we, we don't know what's going to happen, but in 10 years' time, something might spin off, you never know. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think, um, uh, you know, I work in a university institution, and um, uh, I've seen, for example, some of the investments gone in there, it was the previous government, they had the... Um, the pr uh, partners for partners for something like that. Partners for excellence. Partners for excellence and stuff like that. I thought, you know, that kind of really, and then they brought the industry together. I think you just got to do more of that, a lot more of that. And uh, and also, um, there, there is a problem that people get up to a certain stage and they don't know what, we, how to go next, the next stage internationally. And they kind of sort of lose confidence or they don't have management skills. So I think as a whole, and I'm impressed with some of the things that NZT does. I think they've got uh, good people who uh, think about these things. Uh, and that's, for me, where the added value thing, you know, a combination of NZT, NZT and MED with a kind of a forward-thinking government, plus a capital base, seems to me you'd have, uh, uh, plus your commodity producers and others who are thinking, is this all, is this all there is to life? You know, and the farm start, will start to find, actually they can't maintain the same produces <coughs> by selling milk powder. So they then need that added value to sort of maintain, I mean, you know, maybe you could get to that stage, you actually start to encourage and think, actually, we need to go down that track. Yeah, that, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Peter, I wonder if you've done any uh, thinking more on the social side of yeah. like investment in children, yeah. housing. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are fairly critical yeah. to the economy as well. Yeah, yeah. And I just wondered if you've. Yeah, well, ideas well around that. Uh, yeah, no, so what I, I felt was that the, the that, that welfare bargain is at the heart of it, and also the, the way in which uh, the, the sort of active labour market policy sounds a bit laborist and a bit work oriented, but it's. It does require that people are comfortable in their families, that they can go to work without worrying that somebody's going to, like, these things where these kids are being beaten up and killed at home, it's very often where a woman's going to work or something, you know, and the people are being left to look after the kids who are, you know, and, and then they get annoyed and so, you know, so we, we've actually let it just sort of happen without kind of forward planning and to assist people who are trying, in many cases, trying to do their best. The housing thing, you know, the funny thing there is, I would like to see Philip over there. Um, uh, the, the amazing thing here is that actually you can imagine uh, a very uh, useful um, Keynesian-style <laughs> infrastructure investment program, which, uh, without breaking the bank, would do a whole lot of good. Um, so you could actually see a so you could see an economic good plus a social good coming out of that as well. So I mean, uh, and I think pre previous governments of left or centre have tried to do that. So yeah. So I, I, my own feeling is I, I see this as uh, looking at the Nordic um, model is that it's it's kind of a, um, uh, a a way of ensuring that the inequalities of the market, which are so evidently there, uh, that if you don't move in as a government, you will get this exquisite stratification from top to bottom, and then on top of that, you'll get all the layers of further inequality, and after time, you'll get a group at the bottom who really. Uh, are unable to look after themselves, are in very poor social circumstances. And so an active government, it seems to me, has to, uh, has to work on that. And a lot of that has to do with ensuring those people are able to uh, live independent lives and have the skills to be able to 
Because one thing that globalization is doing is that in the old days, you can't, you can't, you could leave school at 15 and so you can't get a job in freezing works. And, uh, uh, you know, and so you, you can't do that anymore. So we actually, in many ways, have to be a lot more paternalistic by ensuring that people don't disappear without skills, even though they don't believe they need them. And somehow keep them in touch. You know, like, uh, there's a, oh, you have a learning account, you know, lifetime learning, and you, you know, after time, you suddenly realize you need that thing to come back in. So, uh, so the people have the skills plus the social sort of fabric that will support them. Uh, sorry, there's a question there and then you hear it. Just from the social democracy point of view, the uh, danger of international corporate uh, intervention in our internal affairs, yeah. uh, which is happening worldwide, you know, the, the, the way in which the US um, corporate controls uh, even the American people are, are getting very uh, aware of that particular problem. Uh, do you see that we should be building more of that sort of uh, warning and uh, theme into um, yeah. the social democracy? Movement? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure how to work that one through because in some ways uh, I actually like things like what the WTO have done, because it's rule-based. They say, if, if these guys uh, are doing things, they shouldn't. Because they do something which is very hard to, uh, like intervening in, um, like they say, India wants to produce uh, cheap drugs for its population, which seems to be a reasonable thing to do, and yet they can bring WTO uh, rules to bear. But in other respects, you can actually, it seems to me, it's better to have a rule-based system, even though you might disagree with some of the rules, than have a, you know, the old kind of uh, you know, Robert Barron type thing. So I, I'm, I, I'm not sure, I'm not as alarmed uh, about that. I am worried that we don't control our banking. You know, we don't have, you know, it worries me that, you know, I think there is aspects of economic sovereignty. That, that, that that's the way I'd approach it, um, that, that we, we let go. And I don't mean that we should pay a huge cost for it, but I can't I'm, I'm imagine. That's why I think the you know, Kiwi Bank is a good idea at last. Imagine what they could do with small business or as an investment bank, you know, if you you wanted to use that, you know, expand that in some way. Uh, but we couldn't do that. We didn't have Kiwi Bank. In other words, we weren't able to do anything other than bribe uh, foreign Australian owned banks. So that's the way I'd come at it. That um, I think economic sovereignty is still pretty important without um, without undermining your economic viability. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering to what extent you feel we might need to change the way we do politics in uh -huh. New Zealand. The Nordic model is based on a high degree of cooperation between big business and the unions mm, and the yeah, political yeah. parties. Yeah. And that often happens behind closed doors. Yeah. They don't necessarily do that in public. In no. public, they're, they're accentuating the conflict yeah. between yeah. them for yeah, 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 obvious yeah. purposes. But yeah, behind yeah. closed doors, there's a high degree of consensus yeah. about how they do things. Yeah. Yeah. In New Zealand, like yeah. America, mm. there's a high yeah, degree of partisanship mm, between right. the, the camp yeah. workers, um, yeah. business, political mm. party, yeah. um, do we need to rethink how we do that and, and to accentuate a bit more cooperation and collaboration? Yeah, I, I, I you know, often we, we, we phrase that, I mean, in a way we're stuck with our, uh, to some degree, our culture, but uh, it, when you look at it, smaller countries find it easier to do these things. They should be able to. You know, when you look at a lot of, you know, look at the Austrias, Finlands, they have been able to find common cause because they realise they're all in it together. Something the size of the states, you know, you can be doing things on the west coast and on the east coast doesn't care. So uh, I feel this, our smallness should make that that, that easier. Um, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, when, when I, I recently I came across uh, the, the, the British Labour government set up um, industry councils where they tried to get the unions and industry on side saying, hey guys, you've got to cooperate, otherwise we're losing this. We're not getting investment in this area unless we get a cooperation on this. And, I, and, I, and of course, they're trying to say things like that, you know, aspects of the motor vehicle industry and so on. Um, and, and so they did have these so-called industry companies. They were tripartite. And I think they did, they did work on all sides. And you've got to rem remember about the, the, the Nordic countries, some like Sweden, you know, they had unbroken rule of social democratic parties basically since the 1930s. So they established the environment in which business had to do business. So in a way, they kind of, knew they had to sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, accommodate. Um, and that's not been the case here at all. So, uh, but I do think in a, in a country our size, uh, in the end, I would have thought you could you could uh, appeal to the, you know, New Zealand Inc. type, New Zealand Inc., which is normally seen as just a business thing, but actually you can bring uh, the other economic partners and government in and have, like, 
Let's take two classic areas, in my view. Fishing. Why is that still being all sourced out to external people, uh, the fishing stocks driven down, and our own people not being employed, and added value? I mean, e even tallies uh, agree that uh, there needed to be some change in that area because they were being undercut probably by foreign. So it, that would be a classic for an industry council. Lot, uh, wood, wood industry, that's another one where you've got uh, basically people sell, selling uh, unprocessed blocks and so on and sure you don't. So it seems to me the number of areas where you could find, possibly with goodwill, because there's no goodwill, you can't do a thing, but there's goodwill and people can see, and you probably need a bit of money as well, investment bank or whatever. You could probably see some some view where the various partners got together. That, Look, there's a win-win here. We're all going to win on this. We're going to get people, our own people employed. Like so you can marry all the, the fishing assets and get their own people unemployed on boats. Yeah, you know, it seems crazy. So, uh, so, uh, so it seems to me there are areas where you could. And I say that the Labour government in the UK did have these sort of industry councils they call them, or sector councils, or something. Like that. Yeah. In terms of our sovereignty. Yeah. Uh, are we ever going to get over? And how will we get over the problem of thinking that all good things come from overseas? <laughs> we talked a moment ago about think big. Yeah, yeah. I was on the TV engineering committee at that time. Mm. We tried to persuade Bill Birch mm. that most of that could be done in New Zealand. Yeah. But they let the contract to Bechtel, mm. the clause in the contract mm. that we were to employ New Zealand resources mm. wherever possible. Mm. They knew that we could roll mm. 25 foot diameter mm. cylinders in New Zealand, mm. so they specified 30 foot yeah, diameter. Yeah, yeah. They brought in everything from the states mm. that they were used to. Mm. And the New Zealand component was some landscaping around the system. Yeah, yeah. And it's gone on and on and yeah, on. Yeah, and I, 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 um, yeah. I don't think we should believe that everything imported, but it is hard for a country of 4 million to do everything itself. And sometimes we, in sport, we try to do it all. <laughs> and sometimes we do brilliantly. But I'm not sure, this is where I think um, we, we should play to our strengths, you know. Whatever they are, there is the, the uh, number eight wire sort of mentality. We do do things good, you know, sort of um, particularly in the, in the uh, agricultural sector. But I do, I also, I do agree with you that we should not be losing key areas of skill willy nilly. And when you look at, you know, the UK and all, they've lost entire areas where they can't do things anymore. Uh, and the Germans never allowed themselves to do that. Uh, and and, I, and, I, and I, think, I think there's still a, a place for ensuring that somehow. The state could play a role in ensuring that we, we the key areas of skill that that, that um, we, we may need and do need, um, without being auto, or, or without autarky, um, we should be quite sort of strategic about it. But I, I think a country of four million, it's hard. Yeah, you know, I, I don't disagree with you. That where possible, New Zealand resources should be used. But I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of thinking that with globalisation, it's actually damn hard for us to to com to compete. On, in a number of areas, and we should stick to what we're good at and where we can. But if we want to be good at something different, yeah, we have to have sure, we have to, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. 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 Is that like to, uh, uh, the thing affecting on your comments about the education system? Yeah. Uh, I've been aghast in my long career in education to see the downgrading of what used to be called manual subjects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the schools want X passes at yeah. some. High level in our very international examinations yeah. and all this, but it, uh, I'm very keen on that. Yeah. A couple of yeah, sure. in the family, and yeah. I'm keen on it. But I'm aghast at the yeah. fact that plumbers and gas fitters and builders yeah. and the people who actually get out there and do excellent work yeah. with their hands are not getting the support into apprenticeships and, and the channels going, you know, oh, he's only going to go to yeah. technical college. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's yeah. only a technical yeah. institution. We've got to get yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And also, I think when you look at some of these, uh, like the, the Germans have a very strong vocational yes. friendship system, I mean, and that's one of their strengths. And you look at some of these Nordic countries, they actually try to make links. And I know we do in this country, I don't know if, but there are certain areas where that's done very well links between local employers and schools and making sure that the kids don't just drop out and actually they, they can see that they're using their skills. It doesn't get into the public discourse. Yeah, no, it doesn't. You know, I think it's right. Right. Middleton and people like yeah. that, they can. Yeah. He's set yeah. up the sort of bridging yeah. course, hasn't he? Yeah. But our, our ordinary school system yeah. is all of being urged to give these artificial, yeah. what is it called, standards, national yeah. standards, and all the rest of it, rather than thinking about what, what, what talent mm. 
has that pit block yeah. underlying on the line, yeah. their ineptitude and some of the more Yeah, yeah more academic stuff, that's right. Um, any questions? One back there, yeah, and then one back there. Yeah, when you're talking about the potential for a more contributory system to restore faith in the yeah. system and that new kind of settlement, yeah. how does a system like that take into account the fact that a lot of people aren't earning enough to yeah. any meaningful contribution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, you, you've got to... Um, I'm not quite sure how it works uh, uh, elsewhere, but, um, you know, for example, if you were to look at... Um, uh, if, say, say you look at KiwiSaver, how does that work for low-income people? Do they make contributions? Mm -hmm. do they? Yeah, percentage. So it would be a percentage of your wage, so it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't actually be a, 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 a total amount. So, uh, and maybe if you go through hard times like being unemployed, then you wouldn't be expected to. I'm not entirely sure how it works, but I, I do know that it, it, however it works, and, and you've got to do it in such a way it is socially just as well, um, that, that one of the arguments is it does, does give people a sense that here's something that they've got a, 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 a stake in and they'll protect it. And also, they, they're quite happy that the money's going towards it. Um, but we don't have that history in this country, and I'm not saying we should suddenly break ranks and do something entirely different, but I think there are some areas like the contributory super and like as a social uh, in, in, in primary care. And maybe there are not many other areas where it could be done in some short. Sorry, it's one question over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, just the um, the Bob Kate Williams. Yeah, Kate. Okay, yeah. Just this. a chapter in here. Yeah. Yeah, it just feels um, um uh, sort of shades of what's happening in the current state yeah, of welfare reform. So I know, I know. I, yeah. I have to say, it feels so like slightly yeah, yeah, critical I agree. about I agree. you know how um how far the, you, go. Uh, you know. There's always the target of the sole mothers, mm. and and the, I don't know whether there's some different language that needs yeah. to be used. Um, you know whether the social contract idea yeah. is, is has got some value, but yeah. the welfare bargain mm. is um, something. Uh, yeah, she uh, used that phrase. It slightly surprised me. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but no, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, some of these things are a bit nuanced. So you would you would imagine that yeah you've got yeah it's got to be something that's possibly debated and agreed that there is definitely social contract here and that people are going to be provided with uh, the basis of a civilized society and that they're going to be able to go to work and maintain their skills without having to worry about how their family is going to fare because where they're going to get the child care from they're going to have to rely on grandparents etc etc it, it is it is troubling i raised this a few years ago i think 2007 at the late uh, summer school and I called it at the time for a new social contract because I was worried that we were getting a form of, um, uh, you know, I, I was again pessimistic about how this little country survives internationally, and I thought that was being being shown in the greater, um, that, 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 you know, the, 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 the room for employment and uh, for people with lower skills, and how, you know, we, how would we compete, say, with the, um, the dairy farms in Latin America, the wood forests there. In the end, what happens is you force down the wages of, of, of the people who are doing the manual work, and so uh, you, you're on a sort of a spiral downwards, and I'm sort of pessimistic about our, 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 our possibilities. So, um, um, so, I, 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 so I was worried that we would end up with large groups of people who were miserated and uh, um, who we maintained because we're a civilized society, but what was the way out of that? Um, and I'm not saying it's easy, but I, I do think there is some, I, I, I do think we're a little bit laissez-faire and cavalier about allowing people to, 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 to disappear into the ether without adequate skills for future employment. Um, I think that it's too much to expect people to maintain their link to, the, in, in, uh, to employment when they, they can't rely on some sort of support for their children. Why should they leave them? Um, so I, I, we've never thought this through properly. And I think other societies have, because they realise it's a public good. People are raising kids and say the previous thought was a totally private thing, but now it's seen as a, something that society has to worry about and should worry about. So it, it is a bit uncomfortable. I've, I've, I've raised it before rather tentatively, and today the only reason I raised it was because uh, Kate Green had it, and then I thought, oh well, that's a little bit of cover. I can just raise it just to see. <laughs> <laughs> just one question, and when you want to finish. Uh, yeah, so she did tax, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Tax directly to a particular system. That's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 and yeah. people did, as you say, mm. make that link and yeah. were happy to pay it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah.
That, that's right. There was a social security tax, and, and uh, yeah, so we did start with that, something along those lines. It just got it looked a bit untidy, which just folded into the tax system and looked simplified. So in many ways, it probably was. And I, I don't want to uh, complicate things and just. You know, <coughs> But the, I think it's a principle well worth thinking about, particularly in the areas of, of um, social institutions that are worried that, that, that a, a different a government, a different coloration could suddenly even see no merit in it. And if you've got something that people have built towards and contribute towards, it's actually a little bit easier to get. <coughs> one, one, one more, one more. Yeah. Um, could you give me how social democracy and the other of the social Māori link that you've been there, how yeah, so what's your name? Dave. Dave, I see. No, no, I just don't remember uh, when I was at med school, uh, a guy called Murray King who went to New uh, York, who was uh, very, very active in the land of um, um, I Look, of course, there was a link that was established between Labour and, and uh, Ratner in the 1930s, and it was an actual one that they were, you know, just basically bringing together people who were disadvantaged by the predominant social and economic system. <coughs> Um, but now things have moved along so much further, I'm just not sure how best to do that, whether it, there should be separate expressions that an MMP then come together later, or whether, in one way, you see lots of other Nordic countries, they're culturally homogeneous. It's much easier to maintain a, um, a social democratic movement which, where, where you've got cultural homogeneity because you get all sorts of other <coughs> dynamics going on. So it's actually harder, in some respects, to maintain some of those, um, the sense of solidarity too, because if you see somebody else uh, and they've got the same colour skin as you and you're in a Nordic country, then yeah, yeah, they've got citizen tribes like me, and then you see somebody who might be a Muslim immigrant and you think, well, oh, I'm not too sure about that one. So, you know, you can see that it's hard to maintain that sense of social solidarity once you introduce. So that's why, I, but I, frankly, I think we're in a much better position than they are because we're, we're a migrant society and we've got going back hundreds of years, people coming in, and I think there's a greater acceptance of that, of that sort of um, variety. Okay. And on that note, we, there was a, we had a, a meeting between uh, the Labour leadership and Ratner leadership in Parliament in the Treaty Room last Friday. Uh, so, you know, there's a, another sense in which I think uh, things what goes, go, went round and oh, yeah. coming round again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'd uh, like to say very much uh, thank you, Peter, for being a real Fabian uh, uh, and uh, talking to us. Uh, inciting uh, debate. Inciting debate. <laughs> um, the, the Fabian legend is sort of caution masking ambition. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, the legend is about the caution, but, but what's really important, I think, and if you look at the achievements of the Fabians, it, it's the ambition that was that was crucial, and, and uh, Fabius Maximus, um, well, he was a, remember he was a general, he was a fighter, he was a very shrewd yeah, general, because he refused to uh, fight until Hannibal's um, supply lines were so stretched that he ended up uh, in, in the defeat of Hannibal. And, and uh, so Peter, I think mm -hmm. I'd like to thank you very much for your your um, thoughtful persistence, because I, I think um, I have a sense that um, uh, you know social de democracy uh, ideas, uh, their time might just be about to come again in a new form. It rethought, and thank you very much for introducing us to that, um, and for your you know your persistence and your thoughtfulness over many years. Um, a, a, uh, for the Fabians, we, we've got more things coming up. Uh, there's a wee newsletter uh, on the table there. Something will be coming out to you all shortly as well about our future program through the year. Um, we'll be bringing the Void to the Lifetime event uh, here uh, to Wellington in November. Uh, and before that, doing a series on uh, light-handed or light-fingered. <laughs> so there's plenty more coming up. So once again, thank you very much, Peter. <laughs>
gold jib. Yeah. 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 Good. Oh, that was a good 